Father's Day to you all, would you join me in the opening acclamation? Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and wordly magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. the church in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. A reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mam as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where's your wife Sarah? And he said, they're in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I've grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh, yes, you did laugh. 
The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have ever said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 116, verse 1, and then verses 10 through 17, which begins on page 759 in the Book of Common Prayer or in this morning's bulletin. I invite us to pray the psalm responsibly by half verse. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I call upon him. How shall I repay the Lord? For all the good that he has done for me. I will lift up the cup of salvation. And call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. In the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord. Is the death of his servants. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill, fulfill my vows to the Lord. In the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house. In the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Our second reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, Indeed, rarely will, any, will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, 
he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, Give without pain. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Come, O Holy One, and fill our hearts with the fire of your love as your word is proclaimed, for these words are proclaimed in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, I have a question for you, and you can actually respond. So, who remembers how Joan of Arc died? How did she die? She was burned at the stake, right. So keep that in mind, because we're going to circle back around to that in just a couple minutes, all right? Today's Old Testament text is the text about Sarah laughing. And it strikes me that I think this would have been a better lectionary text to be, to be read during the month of, of April, because uh, instead of the summer, because that's April, I don't know if you knew this, is National Humor Month. He says Zervis was started in 1976 by humorist Larry Weil, author of 53 books on the subject of humor. That's a lot of books. Um, and director of the Carmel Institute of Humor, whatever that is. According to Mr. Weil's website, National Humor Month is, I quote, designed to heighten public awareness on how the joy and therapeutic value of laughter can improve health, boost morale, increase communication skills, and enrich the quality of one's life. Wilde says, since April is often bleak and grim, and you know, on the 15th, your taxes are due, it can be one of the most stressful times of the year. Besides, it's the only month that begins with All Fool's Day, a day that was sanctioned with frivolity and pranks way back since the 1500s. But another big date, I think, for this text would have been the Sunday following Easter. There is an old tradition in the church called Holy Humor Sunday, or Bright Sunday. It is, a, it is a Sunday after Easter, and it is a day to observe with laughter and joy, with parties and picnics to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Sometimes parishioners and priests will even play jokes, practical jokes on each other, and uh, tell jokes and have fun on that special day. That custom of Bright Sunday got its start in the writings of the early church theologians like Augustine, Gregory of Nyssa, and John Chrysostom. They noted that on Easter, God played a practical joke on the devil by raising Jesus from the dead. Easter was God's supreme joke played on death. The Rhesus Pascalis, or the Easter laugh, as they noted. Personally, uh, I love to laugh. Uh, my wife uh, could not be here today, she's not feeling well. But I, she knows that I'm always cracking jokes around the house. I love satire, I love humor. I told Linda that when I die, presumably I will go first, uh, that when I die, I, I wanted my tombstone to, to read these words. Quote, 
I always knew if I lived long enough, something like this was going to happen. <laughs> I figured, if nothing else, in death, I can still put a smile on someone's face, right? Although I am not a stand-up comic, I, I do believe that those of us who have Jesus within us are all carriers of the joyous good news that Christ defeated death. And I suspect that God continues to have a good laugh about it. In fact, the writer of the psalm, uh, by the way, observed, He who sits in the heavens laughs. <laughs> but our text this morning invites us to think about uh, God's laughter. This incident in the tent with Abraham. And Abraham noticing the three men standing outside the tent and following the hospitality customs of the day. He invites them into his compound to have them rest from the, the heat of the sun and to offer them food to eat. Now, Abraham didn't know it at the time, but it turned out that these three were God and two angels, making this one of the strangest stories in the Old Testament. In any case, after the three had eaten, they inquired about Abraham's wife, Sarah, and they asked where she was. The fact that they knew her name sort of gives you an indication that these were more than just ordinary men. Sarah had not been seen at this point because, again, following the customs of those times, she remained out of sight while her husband carried out the hospitality duties. She is not out of earshot, however. She's just inside on the other side of the tent flap, listening to the conversation between Abraham and the three visitors. And it's important to know before going any further that at this time, Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was around 90 years old. She had never had any children, which was the great disappointment of her life. And then God says to Abraham, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Well, at that advanced age, this announcement struck, uh, strikes Sarah's funny bone. And the Bible tells us that she laughed. And it, it, was, it was either a laugh of skepticism or a laugh at the incongruity of the idea. But it was a laugh. And although it was probably not that loud, God heard it. And he said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Shall I indeed bear a son now that I am old, Sarah thought? Is anything, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? And now, that, by the way, that last part is sort of a rhetorical question. The answer is, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? The answer is, of course not. Nothing is impossible for God. And at that point, Sarah somehow then joins the conversation of the men, probably out of embarrassment, being perceived as being rude. She denies that she laughs, and God says, oh, yes, you did laugh. <laughs> and that's the end of the conversation. But if we jump forward a few months, nine months to be exact, Sarah has a baby boy whom, I, or whom Abraham names Isaac, which means to laugh. And Sarah thought that that was an appropriate name, for she said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. Now, there's no denying that religion is a serious matter and that what you believe makes a difference, a significant difference in your life. But following Jesus is not only about carrying a cross. It's also about sharing in God's belly laugh at death. I don't think we're accustomed to thinking that we're going to go to church and and get a good laugh. But to miss the merriment of the gospel is to miss out on the lift that it gives to life. Before we see that grave, we get to laugh. The late author, Evie White, wrote, uh, who wrote Charlotte's Web, one of my favorite children's books, um, he uh, discussed this matter of humor in one of his essays, and he, he writes these words. The infinitely fascinating, fascinating question, which nobody has managed to answer, of why Americans believe that if a thing is funny, it can be presumed to be something less than great. Because if it were truly great, it would be wholly serious. <laughs> White maintained that a humorous response to life can be just as serious as a humorless one. Now, my intention uh, is hardly to tell you to take laughter seriously. I think that. That's an oxymoron, if ever there was one. But the Bible itself reminds us that there is, in addition to a time to laugh, a time to weep, Ecclesiastes 3. 
And it's also true that some, some types of laughter that we have in our society, in our world, are really quite ungodly, including the laughter that is mocking and ridiculing, or the kind that finds glee in the pain or troubles of others, or the kinds that tries to excuse wrongdoing by dismissing, well, we're just having fun. I'm just kidding. Now, that being said, I want to remind you that the gospel is, a, at root, good news. And that Christianity is a faith that proceeded into the world by the joy of those first disciples. And here's something else. Good humor and faith are connected. Reinhold Niebuhr, one of the great theologians of the 20th century, explained it like this. He said, humor is concerned with the immediate incongruities of life and faith with the ultimate ones. Laughter is our reaction to immediate incongruities and those which do not affect us, essentially. And faith is the only possible response to the ultimate incongruities of existence which threaten the very meaning of life. So, humor is, in fact, a prelude to faith. And laughter is the beginning of prayer. In the Holy of Holies, laughter is swallowed up in prayer and humor is fulfilled by faith. In other words, clear joy, the wholesome spirit of gladness, is the sign that God is with us. God is the spirit of gladness, and God preserves us. One Sunday, a mother woke up not feeling well, so she was not able to accompany her family to church. And when they got back home, she asked her young daughter what the sermon was about. And she thought for a minute, and she said, hmm. She said, laugh, you'll get your quilt. And the mother went, laugh, you'll get your quilt. And later she asked what her husband, what the priest homily's title was. And he laughed, and he said, be joyful, your comforter is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Samuel Upham was a professor of theology at Drew University many years ago, and he died in 1904 at the age of 70. But in the last hours of his life, he was lying on his bed at home, surrounded by his friends. And at one point, they all thought he had passed away. And one, one woman who was there t uh, touched his feet and said, no, he's not dead. Feel his feet. They're still warm. No one ever died with warm feet. And at that point, Dr. Upham opened his eyes and said, Joan of Arc dead. <laughs> Those were his last words. <laughs> and evidence that even in those final moments, he was preserved by God's spirit of gladness. <laughs> and so are all of us who follow Jesus. And they will know us by the fruits that we bear. May they know us as ones who take faith seriously and do so with laughter and joy in our hearts. response to what we've heard, let us stand now and say together the ancient Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. 
in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, she is worshipped and glorified. She has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are form six found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 392. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop. For Kathleen, our diocesan bishop. And Mark, our priest for all bishops and other ministers, and for the Heartland Minster. For all who serve God in the church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, you may add your own petitions. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. A collect for this special day. God, our Father, we give you thanks and praise for fathers young and old. We pray for young fathers newly embracing their vocation. May they find courage and perseverance to balance work, family, and faith in joy and sacrifice. We pray for our own fathers and for the fathers around the world whose children are lost or suffering. May they know that God of compassion walks with them in their sorrow. We pray for men who are not fathers, but mentor and guide others with fatherly affection, love, and advice. We remember fathers, grandfathers, and great-grandfathers, and uncles who are no longer with us, but who live forever in our memory and nourish us with their love. Bless, we pray this day and always, all of our fathers in the faith, who have nurtured and emulate your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us now pray for our forgiveness of our sin. Praying together. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all of your sins, sir, Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Also with you. Let us share Christ's peace with one another. And make sure all of us feel welcome.
Well, good morning, church. It's a joy to worship with you, to laugh, and to celebrate God's presence among us this day as we gather in God's name. And I uh, want to especially welcome our family guests here today and uh, pray God's safe traveling mercies for this, this upcoming week. I um, want to wish uh, Rick and Colleen Mitchell, who are not with us today, but they're having an anniversary this week, so we pray God's blessings upon them. And uh, please join us for a few minutes for our Father's Day coffee hour immediately after the service. Um, it'll be a, a good time together, and I hope you'll stick around and uh, take some time to share fellowship with one another. You're always welcome to join me for corporate morning prayer Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, uh, I'm in the rector's office. Uh, I just ask you to come a little bit early if you come uh, to do it in person, but you can also pray with us online on Facebook uh, when we live stream at 9 a.m. The Summertime Supper Club is, uh, this coming week is a, no, it's not this week, it's, it's the week after this week, sorry. Uh, it's the 27th, and it's a festival of salads. Uh, and so what we invite you to do is just bring whatever your favorite salads are, and it could be anything. If you're not a salad person, bring something else. We're really not that picky. Uh, people will eat what you bring, basically. Um, but um, but uh, it'll be fun just to get together. We'll do it here in the parish hall at 6 p.m., just so we know how many drinks and things to prepare, if you could still text me and let me know if you're coming, that would be a helpful thing to do. And my number is in the bulletin. Um, or uh, it should be also in your uh, half sheet as well. Due to recent surge in demand, uh, uh, and also because... Um, uh, I'm forgetting which program now. It's not WIC. It's the, it's the other one. What is it? SNAP. Thank you. SNAP program. The, uh, the reduction in the SNAP program, we have, we've seen an increasing um, amount of people coming to the church for help. And, and the director's discretionary fund is, is a little low right now. So if you um, are able to uh, give some extra money towards that fund, it will, all that goes to help other people. And so um, just uh, make sure you mark it on your check or if you give cash, make sure you give it to Bill and say this is for the director's discretionary fund. And it'll get, uh, it'll get there. So thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Be imitators of God and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
invite God's Spirit to be with us and to bless these gifts. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in fulfillment of His true promise, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them to lead them in, uh, into all truth and uniting peoples of many tongues in the confession of one faith and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood and to preach the gospel to all nations. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels, and with archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemptional Father in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and the blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with St. Andrew and all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. I send you out into a new week as those who have been filled now with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. May joy well up within you and overflow from you that joy of the Lord, that gladness of spirit that others may see the riskest pascalis in you, the Easter laugh, and come to laugh too at death because Christ is alive in them. And may the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and bring you great joy. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.